is order technically speaking in my way of viewing the world is order is that domain you inhabit when what you're doing produces the results that you want to have happen that's a pragmatic perspective from from a philosophical perspective it's derived at least in part or is analogous to the pragmatism of people like um, um, C.S. Peirce and William James the, the American the early American pragmatists um, and there's a great book on all that if you're interested called the metaphysical club um, so order is where you are when what you're doing is producing the results that you intended and that validates what you're doing by the way that that's a pragmatic form of truth your theory is accurate when if you enact it then the results that you intend emerge that's the definition of truth from a pragmatic perspective it's a very powerful definition and it's very much associated with the Darwinian notion of truth so that's worth that's worth looking into now obviously there are times when you implement a plan and a, and a world conception that goes along with that plan and what you wanted didn't happen and so then the domain of chaos comes up the domain of the unpredictable and unexpected and you have to contend with it and sometimes when you um, are acting you do perverse things and things that that surprise you and then things don't work out well for you or or maybe you get a surprise and maybe sometimes that might even be positive and that's because the chaos within you has manifested itself and you've done something that exceeds the bounds of your understanding and you know that can happen to people so badly that they develop post traumatic stress post traumatic stress disorder sometimes soldiers especially naive young soldiers will go on a battlefield and watch themselves do something they can't imagine they're capable of doing and then they have permanent post traumatic stress disorder so there's a chaos within that can manifest itself that can disrupt whatever order you are um, and you know that in minor ways because everybody's always running around doing things that aren't good for them that they know they shouldn't do and that they can't control and so there's a chaotic and an orderly aspect to everything to the individual to the family to the social world to the natural world it's chaos and order at every level of analysis simultaneously which is why the Taoists think of the world as made out of yin and yang which is essentially um, analogous to the idea of order and chaos and now but then there's an, another element too so your order and your chaos and w the place that you live the environment is order and chaos as well but you're also the process that mediates between the two and what that means is you're the force that confronts chaos and casts it into order we talked about that in the free will discussion that's the basis for the dragon myth or at least part of it the hero myth you're the force that confronts chaos and transforms it into habitable order and there's an idea that if you do that using truthful speech it's probably the deepest idea in the Bible if you confront chaos and the unknown using truthful speech then the order that you produce is good so that also means that your chaos and order and the process that intermediates between them and that's really the basis of the hero myth so part of that is the hero story and the dragon myth go out confront the dragon get the gold bring it back share it with the community and, and the dragon is a representation of that which dwells beyond the confines of the safe and habitable space right it's an image of a predator that's part of what it is although it's way more complicated than that and you're also the force that confronts order when it becomes too tyrannical and restructures it back to chaos and then restructures the chaos back into more beneficial order which is what you do for example if you have a an argument with someone that you settle right because the argument takes the orderly um, relation that you have with that person and then produces a chaotic interlude which is all the pain that's associated with the argument and that's a dissolution into what Mircea Eliade called pre-cosmogonic chaos and out of that a new order can emerge and so the best way to construe yourself is not as chaos or as order but as the process that mediates between them and that's the basis for the ethos of the West is that the human being is best represented as the individual and the individual is that attentive and communicative entity that is continually capable of, of mediating properly between chaos and order now this is a deep idea you could read maps of meaning if you would like um, the audio version of that is coming out June 12th by the way and I will make a video detailing the relationship between maps of meaning and 12 rules of life but you can construe yourself you should construe yourself as the process that mediates between chaos and order 
and you should aim to be the process that does that properly using truthful communication because that's how you keep the elements of existence properly balanced and you might say yeah but is that real well if you read maps of meaning there's a section on neuropsychology that's also buttressed by a book written by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary that lays out the relationship between the right and left hemisphere. Now, it's quite strange that we have a right and left hemisphere. It, it's almost as if we have two consciousnesses dwelling in our, in our, in our, in our being. Um, and they're quite separable. If you cut the corpus callosum that unites the two, then the two hemispheres will act independently to some degree. You can communicate with each of them somewhat independently. So they actually view the world quite differently. And that, that hemispheric distinction is not only there in human beings, but also in animals, a long way down the phylogenetic chain. Now, I made the claim, partly because I was reading a man named uh, Elkhorn and Goldberg, who was a student of Alexander Luria, the most brilliant neuropsychologist of the 20th century. And... And Goldberg made the case that um, the left hemisphere is specialized for, um, for what's known and the right hemisphere is specialized for anomaly. And V.S. Ramachandran, who's a famous neurologist, um, an MD in, in California, has also made a very similar claim based on his analysis of brain damaged individuals. But Goldberg's case was the left hemisphere is specialized for what you know how to do and the right hemisphere is specialized for response to what's unknown. And that maps onto this order chaos dimension, right? And the right hemisphere. Now, um, McGilchrist, in his book, The Master and His Emissary, has pointed out quite clearly that the left hemisphere has a tyrannical tendency, which Ramachandran also viewed in his um, brain-damaged patients, by the way, and that the left hemisphere is always trying to impose its logical and restricted order on the world and to make the world fit into that. Now it has to do that. There's reasons for that. Part of the reason is is that if your theory you've worked on for 10 years makes one prediction error, you shouldn't throw the whole damn thing out. You should doubt the prediction error, right? Because you never know when your data is actually data or is just another kind of theory. We can't get into that at the moment. Now, um, McGilchrist makes a very strong case and, and I think a more elaborated case than I made in Maps of Meaning, but it's the same argument fundamentally, that the right hemisphere is concerned with reaction to anomaly. And so, so what happens in some sense is something unexpected happens, that's the domain of chaos. And that stops you in your tracks, it freezes you, and that's a predator response, a prey response actually. You're frozen. The unknown has manifested itself. You're not in order anymore. You don't know where you are and you don't know what to do. And so, and you can't just shut down like a computer does. You freeze instead. And then what happens is that the ancient mechanisms that have helped our ancestors for tens of millions of years or perhaps longer than that react to that which lurks beyond the confines of the unknown kick in and you start first of all that's motoric so you freeze and then you cautiously start to explore and then it's imagistic you start making imaginal representations metaphoric representations dramatic representations of what might constitute the unknown and then those representations are practiced and implemented in the world and they become more and more fine-grained and automatized and as that happens the locale that they're represented in in the brain shifts from right to left so 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 the reason i'm telling you all this is because you know this is where the metaphysical and the physical unite and this is the sort of argument that i was trying to make to sam harris and hopefully we'll be able to continue doing that because i'm going to meet him three times in the next few months so that the, the yin-yang idea, the chaos order idea, is metaphorical in some sense. To say that the world is made up of order and chaos doesn't sound like an empirical statement. But strangely enough, the world to which our brains are adapted is actually the world of chaos and order. You can think about it as unexplored and explored territory too. That's another, that's another you know, take on it. And so then you think from a Darwinian perspective, think about it this way. From a Darwinian perspective, there's an there's an, an axiomatic presupposition, and that is reality is that which selects, okay? Reality is the force that selects over evolutionary time. And so the force that selects over evolutionary time has selected for hemispheric specialization, bilateral hemispheric specialization, which indicates that two different modes of looking at the world are necessary for survival, right? So that's real. And so the idea that the world is made out of chaos and order is perhaps the most real idea. Now, here's something else cool that's associated with that. 
And this is an antidote to nihilism. I also think it's an antidote to, to what would you call um, ideological, ideological possession. So when you encounter something unknown, you orient towards it. And that's an involuntary response. You could even think about it as a deterministic response. It's part of what orients you very rapidly towards predators so that they don't kill you before you have a chance to respond. Okay, so you react because the anomalous thing is meaningful. It's intrinsically meaningful. And the reaction is first terror with perhaps an overlay of disgust and second curiosity. And it's terror so that you freeze and remain paralyzed. You turn to stone when you look at the basilisk or the snake or the gorgon. You turn to stone. You're paralyzed like a prey animal. And that's so the prey predator can't see you, at least in part. And there's other elements of the orienting reflex that are associated with predator avoidance. And then if nothing additionally terrible happens, you start to thaw out and you start to explore. And you do that with image first and, and, then, pra and then practice the appropriate behaviors and then, and then automate those. Now, look, here's the thing that's cool. So that orienting reflex to the unknown is it's an admixture of threat, fear, and curiosity, incentive reward. So negative emotion and positive emotion. Now, and it's dose dependent. The larger the anomaly, which means the larger the map it blows out when it manifests itself. Think of the difference between being irritated at your uh, marital partner because they, you know, um, oh, who knows because they were late to pick you up for work compared to how irritated you would be if you found out they were having an affair. Difference in size of anomaly. The first one disrupts a tiny little part of your space-time orientation and the second one demolishes your past, present and future. And the larger the disruption, the more negative emotion, obviously. And so, so there's this weird interplay between negative and positive emotion in the response to anomaly. And but it's deeply meaningful, even if, it's, even if it paralyzes you, even if it's terrifying, it's meaningful. And then that transforms perhaps into intense curiosity and you start to explore. Now, the phenomena of meaning is a manifestation of the complex orienting reflex. And so you're wired so that you're not just order and you're not just chaos. You're order continually confronting chaos so that the order remains updated. And you might say, well, how do you know how much chaos you should confront in order to keep the order continually updated? And the answer is meaning. See, something is meaningful. The reason that something is meaningful is because you're getting a deep instinctual signal that you're encountering anomaly at a rate that doesn't exceed your capability. That's also the rate at which you can keep yourself updated optimally. And so meaning isn't epiphenomenal and it, and it isn't it isn't some kind of delusion that rationality can and should overcome to say, well, everything's meaningless. It's like, no, it's not. Meaning is the most fundamental instinct for adaptation. And so that's partly why in 12 Rules for Life, I said one of the rules, um, I think it's rule seven, is do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Because meaning is a really good guide to long-term adaptation. And so then, and the other thing about meaning which is what happens when you get the balance between chaos and order right, is that meaning is the antidote to despair. And so if you, and there's all sorts of reasons in life to be desperate. And so if you immerse yourself in meaning, you can learn to do that. You can learn to do that. You can make that goal your highest goal. And so then the highest goal would be to be the sort of mythological hero, let's say, to embody and incarnate and imitate the mythological hero like the imitation of Christ which is what you're called to do if you happen to be Christian that means that you live in meaning and that meaning is the antidote to the suffering of life that would otherwise make you brutal and vengeful and unhappy and miserable and like that that young guy who just mowed down 12 people in Toronto these are real things you lose your sense of meaning you end up in hell and in hell you do all sorts of terrible things these are, these are dreadful realities, and it isn't as if they're